that's going to get things started for you. So uh, I'm Aaron Jorben, uh, and I'm going to be talking about automating your front end development workflow. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to not take notes. My slides are up on GitHub already. Um, GitHub under my account, which is Aaron Jorben, um, or you can go to this short link to go right to them. So we all have a workflow. In fact, we all have many of them. Human beings are creatures of habit. In Thinking Fast and Slow, Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman describes our use of intuition to remember the steps in our workflows and the order in which we do our workflows. When we wake up, we get out of bed, we go to our the bathroom, brush our teeth, perhaps shower, make ourselves a bowl of oatmeal. All of this comes natural. We don't think about it. You know, and if we do, we think about it so lightning fast that we don't even notice that we are thinking about it. By retracing these steps we've done a hundred times, you know, it just comes natural. We've trained our body to follow a workflow. My goal today is for you to understand how to look at your development workflow to find and achieve the same self sense of self-automation in your development that you achieve in your morning routine. I'm going to explore how to take a look at your workflow to find points for automation also going to show you some tools to use in order to achieve this automation and speed up your entire workflow. So first off, we have to look at how are we spending our time? You know, how are we as developers working? What are we spending our time trying to achieve and trying to do? And there's a couple of ways we can actually look back and, you know, take a big picture of how we are working. So the first is pen and paper. We can write down the steps that we are taking. We can write down that, you know, we are first, you know, when we get a bug report, the first thing we do is we go to track and we file it. And the second step after that is that we try to replicate it. You know, the step after that is that we try and, you know, fix it. Perhaps we write a unit test before that, you know, depending on how our workflow is. So we can try writing all these things down. Uh, but this is kind of inefficient and kind of annoying. Um, and no one really wants to bother, you know, writing down every step that they take. Uh, so we can use a tool for this. We can use something like Rescue Time, which allows you to, you know, take a look at every step, you know, how you're actually spending your time on your machine. What websites are you visiting? What, uh, you know, order are you visiting them in? You know, how much uninterrupted time do you have in a row that you're actually focused on completing a task? Uh, Rescue Time can actually be a great tool for this. Um, another really good tool, uh, if you develop using the command line like I do, is history. You can actually look at every command that you type into the terminal. Uh, and if you do cool things like this, you can actually build a graph that will show you, you know, when you're being the most active. Um, now, I'm not quite sure why at 3 a.m. on Sundays I'm quite active, but apparently I like to code when I get home from the bars which probably explains some of the reasons that I'm coding much later in that Sunday as well. But, you know, these are tools that we can use. Another great one, and you can steal this from, you know, the way user experience professionals find out about how users are using your application, is to record your screen. If you think about a basketball player, you know, going and shooting free throws, they might be videotaping themselves shooting free throws so that they can watch how they shoot. They can watch and see, you know, am I bending my knees at the proper angle? You know, are my arms, you know, where they should be? Am I actually releasing the ball properly? By actually watching how you work, you'll learn and you'll be able to identify ways to improve your workflow. You know, and history is actually one that we take from sysadmins. Um, I believe as developers, there's a lot we can learn from our brethren that are you know, doing other things related to computers. Sysadmins and UX professionals are two great ways just to figure out alternative ways to approach an idea and solve a problem. So, okay, so tools rock. Um, we all want to use cool tools in order to achieve things. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of tools that I like, um, some that you know I really like, some that I think aren't as good, but they might inspire you. Um, I don't want you guys to rush out and try you know, all of these, because there are many of them. What you should probably do is, you know, see one or two that actually reach out to you, that you're like, 
that's going to solve a problem that I face on a regular basis and try to see how those interact with your workflow and see if those will assist you in working faster and working better. So the first is adding a hint of programming to our CSS. So three tools that we can use to do this are less, SAS, and Silas. Less and Silas are JavaScript-based CSS preprocessors. SAS is a Ruby-based CSS preprocessors. This adds programming to our CSS. This gives us things like variables. We can define what blue means in our context. Blue doesn't have to be you know, the standard blue in a browser. Blue can be whatever shade of blue we want, and thus we can use blue. And then when we go and do a redesign, we can change blue. And now blue can be something you know different. It's much easier. Uh, it also gives you things like mixins, and so you can define that you know all things are going to have these you know uh, anchors have these properties, and you don't have to assign it to the global anchor. You can assign it to specific anchors and just mix them in and bring them in the areas that you want to. The next thing to do is to learn to love the command line. Uh, the command line has saved me hours upon hours just by learning some basic Unix things. Uh, the first thing is dot .file all the things. Um, dot .files, you know, a bash RC file, a vim RC file, a screen RC file. Any program that you're really using more than never uh, should have some sort of config. Configure it to do the things you want it to do. Behave the way you want it to behave. If you have to SSH into a server and that server's name is 40 characters, it should have an alias because no one wants to type out 40 characters just so that they can connect to a box to do some more work. If you want to learn about dot .files, GitHub has done some great work on, this, on dot .files. They found some great examples of people sharing their dot .files and making them available. You can go and grab dot .files that you know Paul Irish from Google is using. You can grab the dot .files that I'm using and you know see how our workflow is learn you know the programs that we're using the configurations that we're using to adapt to yourself you know by looking at this the habits of highly successful people we can become highly successful ourselves uh, engineers have opinions and so you know these programs will often be opinionated um, and thus they might not always work for you but you should still try them out and see how people are doing things because you'll often be able to change your own opinion just by looking at other people's opinions. This is an example of a great uh, uh, command line script that I've run often. Um, all this does is tell me, you know, I'll walk through it, uh, catting the access log, so we want to, you know, read the access log. We want to cut it, it's eliminating on a space, and we want the seventh field. Um, in my access log, this is the page that's requested. Uh, we want to sort it, we want to count the uniques, and then we want to sort it based on how many uniques you get. So this will tell me how many hits I get on every page. Uh, and this is you know, one line writing on the command line, rather than having to go to Google Analytics, sign in, uh, navigate to the specific page that I want to navigate. You know, that's more steps than I need to take, whereas I can do one line on the command line and I have my answer right away. The next is to tab complete things. So one of the dot files that you'll find on GitHub is called bash it. Um, and this will enable you, and it has a whole bunch of auto completion. So if you normally type git and you type, you know, commit, um, that's two words. And you think, you know, all right, well I can, you know, just type gi tab and that will give me git. Uh, you know, C, you know, if you add auto-completion to these tools, if you add auto-completion to Git, auto-completion to uh, to do, which is another app that I use, uh, to SSH, you can save yourself time. Additionally, by tab completing, you're less likely to misspell things. Um, I'm a notoriously horrible speller amongst my friends, uh, to the point that some of them like to tweet about when I learn about how to turn on uh, spell check and Skype, um, that, you know, tab complete saves me from making, you know, mistakes that I make a lot. Auto jump is another really cool tool. 
auto jump allows you to instead of having to CD you know the entire path to a folder you can just jump based on how you CD'd in the past so how you've changed directories in the past will dictate where you're going in the future so for example you know you might have you know in your home directory a sandbox uh, WordPress plugins a specific plugin that you're experimenting with uh, and you might actually be in your sites folder in WordPress 3.4 and you know you want to jump back over. By using auto jump you don't have to you know type the entire path you can just type you know part of the path it's, and it learns based on your behavior it teaches itself you know based on you it's really personalized and great. Additionally we can script out our tasks you know I showed you the cut task, we can make that a bash function, and now it's one word. Now we could say, you know, today sets, and it will output that. By scripting out, by writing down what we do, we save ourselves time. Commander.js is a Node.js framework for writing really basic command line scripts. Uh, it makes things incredibly easy. It also makes documentation for you just by decide, you know by naming things uh, by putting in all your options you automatically get a dash help and that will tell you all of your options so that you can share these scripts and now the rest of your team can also be using and working off of these little scripts that you're building for yourself additionally because it's node.js and it's javascript it's the same language that we're writing on the front end we don't have to learn a new language in order to complete these tasks. Git SVN is a great tool for if you have to deal with SVN. Um, so I, for one, um, I'm a Git fan. I think you know many people nowadays are becoming Git fans, but you know we often end up working in SVN environments. Uh, we work with WordPress in an SVN uh, environment. You can work in the plugins repo using Git SVN. Use Git locally and push to an SVN server. Uh, it makes it incredibly easy to not have to deal with, you know, dealing with SVN, you know, for these projects and Git for these other projects. You can use Git and only have to learn one uh, version control system. You can use the hooks to give yourself a workflow. So every version control system contains a workflow in them. You know, it contains the steps that it takes. You know, when you commit something, you know, it does a pre-commit, it does a pre-message before, you know, you type in your message. So you can auto-populate what your message will be based on what you're doing. Perhaps, you know, you want your message to always list, uh, you know, specific CSS classes you change. You could do that, you know, with a hook and never have to worry about typing it uh, and auto-populate your message that way. You can have it run your unit test before you even commit. You know, it can reject a commit for you and say like, nope, no good, your tests are failing, like this commit like, is not good for everyone, uh, try again. Like, by using these hooks, we're able to you know, automate our workflow. Uh, you can also do uh, fun things with hooks. Uh, there's a recent article on how to take a picture of yourself every time you commit. Uh, and then you can do a little video showing what you look like you know, whenever you're working. Like, it seems like an interesting project. I mean, imagine like, you know, your facial expression every time you commit code. I think it sounds like fun. Uh, you can deploy just by pushing to GitHub using a hook. Uh, all of these are links also to articles, so you can, you know, find out exactly how to do these things. Uh, it's really easy just by using these hooks, by using these workflows that we're given to automate our process. The next is we need to have build scripts. Um, if you are building by hand, um, then I'd like to welcome you to 2004. Um, you know, in 2004, the idea of deploying software meant that, deploying a website, that you had to get a sysadmin, you had to schedule time with them, you know, they had to rsync files over for you. Uh, it was a long, you know, cumbersome process back in the day. Uh, now, it doesn't need to be that way. 
Uh, there's IRC bots that we can set up to do our deploys for us, for us to be able to say, you know, uh, deploy new site, and it will handle that for us, just by having these build scripts. So some of these build scripts that we can use are Grunt. Uh, Grunt is a Node.js based build script, primarily designed for front-end development. It uh, allows you to put in the tasks in the order that you want to run things. So you can run, you know, your concatenation of your files. You don't have to run YUI yourself and, you know, minify your JavaScript. You don't have to run uh, closure style sheets to minify your CSS. You don't have to run uh, SAS in order to generate your CSS. Like, all of that can be handled for you. Uh, Grunt also includes watch tasks. So you could have it, you know, be doing these tasks locally every time you save. You could be, you know, running your unit tests every time you save and get a growl notification that your tests are failing. Uh, you get a growl notification every time you save that you have a syntax error. You don't even have to you know, try running your code to find out. You get these notifications. Uh, Hudson and its modern counterpart Jenkins are continuous integration servers that allow us to do this on a server level. So everyone can be pushing you know, to their repository and then having this continuous integration server building for you and building on you know, different commands. Maybe you want to build to a certain environment every hour. You want an hourly snapshot. Uh, you want to be able to save the you know, 24 most recent snapshots to be able to go back and look and see you know, where things break. Or maybe you want to be building to a dev environment every time that you commit. Uh, and you know, running all of these unit tests and not have to deal with them running locally, uh, not have to deal with you know, every, if you have a large team, with every member of your team setting up this complicated environment. You can set it up once on the server and have it all taken care of for you. Uh, WP Stack is an interesting project that Mark Jaquith, one of the lead developers of WordPress, just launched uh, that allows you to automate launching a WordPress site to a development environment and a production environment using Capistrano. Uh, it's a really interesting way you know, you, to just quickly and easily be deploying and building and you know, getting your code out there so you can fail faster. Forge is an interesting tool that uh, the Theme Foundry has built. Um, it's actually what was used to build the initial version of the next default theme for WordPress 2012. Um, it's a very opinionated workflow for how theme development should be. Uh, it uses uh, SAS and Compass for all the CSS. It, you, know, you also watch all the files, so every time you save, it builds and links to your next, uh, or the next build. Allows you to uh, easily just deploy or uh, build a, uh, a zip file for you to upload to the WordPress theme repository. Uh, like I said though, it's kind of opinionated. Like it is built and designed for the specific workflow that uh, the guys in the theme foundry are using and the uh, DWAP. Um, so it might not work for everyone, but it is definitely something worth checking out. Uh, it's a Ruby project. Uh, Brunch is a, another opinionated uh, workflow and this is more more generally geared at uh, basic static sites, so not necessarily you know a WordPress site, but it can definitely be adapted to it. Um, also, an interesting idea of building and deploying quickly, um, but again, an opinionated workflow, so it might not work for you. Uh, you can also just make your own basic script and decide you know how you want to deploy. Uh, there's a great Node library called Watch that allows you just to easily watch for a file change. And uh, a lot of the watch programs I've found don't scale very well. You try watching you know, a WordPress site you know, in the full WordPress folder uh, with you know, a normal you know, 20 or 30 plugins and a theme, and you know, it starts to eat memory and starts to eat CPU. Uh, watch does a really good job of not doing that. It allows you to really watch the entire WordPress uh, folder for changes. And then when it changes, it fires an event. And you can say, you know, on change, I want to uh, 
you know, deploy up to this dev server uh, so that my designers can see. Um, every time you say it, do I. Um, or you can, you know, write your own rules. By writing, you know, these basic scripts, you can decide what works for you and what works for your team. Uh, you can also do what are known as compile time defines. And so every time that you uh, compile your JavaScript, you can perhaps define specific variables. And so you can define debug being true every time that you save. However, that doesn't get defined when you decide to deploy to production. And that'll make sure that you never accidentally have debug statements go to production. Uh, and this is also incredibly useful if you want to do unit testing. Uh, unit testing is a great way to save yourself time, a great way to not repeat your mistakes. Um, there's a bunch of really good talks out there. Uh, Nikolay, uh, and I'll butcher his last name, so I won't even bother saying it, but it starts with a B. Uh, did a great talk at WordCamp San Francisco last year on PHP unit tests. Uh, I did one on JavaScript unit tests at WordCamp San Francisco last year. Uh, testing will prevent you from repeating your mistakes. Um, it is good. Uh, it should be automated. Uh, so tools we can do to do that uh, include Travis CI. Uh, Travis CI is an open source, uh, continu or a continuous integration server for open source projects, specifically aimed at projects hosted on GitHub. Uh, and if you want to see an example of how to configure this for a WordPress plugin, then WP Document Revisions by Ben Balcher, which was a Google Summer of Code project last year, is a great example and will show you exactly how to set up your test folder, how to set up the Travis uh, configuration, and thus run tests on you know every the latest version of WordPress, the you know last version, and the trunk uh, development version, along with you know against PHP 5.2, PHP 5.3, uh, with multi-site on and multi-site off. Um, all of these running your tests for you, um, incredibly easy, and every time that you push to get them. Uh, Jasmine is a really cool uh, unit testing framework. Uh, there's a lot of different options for JavaScript unit tests. Um, all of them are definitely worth checking out and figuring out which one works best for you. So Jasmine is one. Uh, QUnit is another, and this is from the jQuery guys. Uh, Mockjax is a cool project that allows you to override the default Ajax behavior. And so instead of actually making a request to the server, you can define what the return is going to be uh, for your unit tests. Um, this also has some really cool potential for doing uh, quick prototypes. And so you can have the Ajax behavior happening without having to set up the server to actually do what you need it to do if you just want to rapidly prototype. Uh, Mocha is another unit testing framework. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also, um, you know, in addition to all these tools, we can put our browser to work for us. Uh, browsers have been making great strides, and there's a lot of really cool browser-based tools to help us out. Uh, Live Reload is one of them. Uh, if you are, you know, saving your file, going to the browser and hitting refresh, um, that's more steps than you need to take these days. With something like Live Reload, we can tell our browser to listen for an event, and then our watch can emit that event uh, to, you know, refresh the browser. Uh, there's a free command line version of this, and then there's also um, a GUI that I think is $10 in the Mac App Store, and free right now on Windows, so they claim it's in very beta condition. So your mileage may vary, or it may just, you know, you may get no mileage. Uh, .js is a, basically what uh, Grease Monkey, you know, is nowadays. Um, allows you to just have a folder that you can version uh, and store in GitHub of you know, JS files to run on specific sites so that you, know, you can go to a specific site and uh, you know, automatically make changes, uh, do whatever you need to do. It's a really interesting project, um, really cool way to do quick prototypes uh, instead of having to do a full browser extension. Uh, source maps, uh, push your hands. Who here has used source maps before? All right, uh, so if you haven't used source maps, you haven't experienced Shakespeare the way it's supposed to be done. And source maps allow you to view in your browser, in your uh, code inspector, the 
source of the JavaScript that was compiled already. So it, it'll get compiled, it'll get minified, it'll become a you know, human unreadable form. With source maps, the browser will revert it back to how it was supposed to be. Uh, right now it's supported in Chrome, um, ugly, uh, Uglify JS, and Google Chrome, uh, uh, Google Closure Compiler are the two compilers that allow you to actually build these. Um, definitely worth checking out if you're doing any sort of large JavaScript work. This also works for CSS, and it can also work for your pre-processed CSS. So if you're working in SAS, you can see in your browser what the SAS is. Uh, what the, you know, instead of having to try to think, you know, and figure out how it maps back, you'll actually be seeing the actual code in your browser. Um, and then you know, you can obviously turn this off when you go to production, so that if you don't want your regular users to be able to see it, they don't. And interesting idea. Um, you don't even have to use a real browser for a lot of these things, for a lot of these tools. Uh, there's a great project called PhantomJS that's a headless browser. And basically allows you to, from the command line, you know, run a browser. Um, and it's a real browser. It's using V8 uh, and it's using WebKit to actually be a browser and just not at all connected to, uh, you know, an actual machine. So you can run this on your server to say run your JavaScript unit tests um, and not have to set up like something like Selenium to, you know, hit a browser, have the browser actually run it. Um, it's all done for you headlessly. Uh, we also want tools that help keep our code looking nice. Uh, so for JavaScript, we can use a program called AutoLint that will automatically watch our files um, and every time we save them, give us a growl notification if our linting fails, if you know we're missing a semicolon, or you know if we want to be strict, if we want to enforce you know specific coding standards on ourselves or on our team, we can actually define them and every time we save, get notified of errors. Get notified, you know, that you're doing something that could be, you know, that could break in IE. Um, it's a really cool, interesting tool. Uh, we can also use this uh, if you're using Sublime 2. Uh, there's a Sublime 2 plugin called Sublime Linter that will do the exact same thing. Uh, Sublime Linter also includes tool or connections for CSS, PHP, and I believe a few other languages as well to handle this for us. Uh, Closure Linter is another one, a uh, project from Google that allows us to, you know, check to make sure that our, you know, code is right. Um, and this is a good one if you want to run it uh, on a server so that each individual member of the team doesn't need to set up their own environment. Uh, for CSS, we have options like Recess. Uh, Recess is a tool from Twitter. Uh, Jacob, uh, also known as Fat, who is the main author of Bootstrap, wrote Recess to enforce the Twitter coding standards for CSS um, and allows you to you know, check to make sure that the CSS standards are correct. Uh, WordPress is starting to have CSS standards of its own, of how they want properties to be ordered. Uh, we could set up a config of recess in order to make sure that you know, our CSS is actually following the proper WordPress standards. Uh, CSS Lint is another similar project. Um, I like CSS Lint a little bit more because it's a little more configurable um, and it's also a little more mature of a product, but I think that it's not going to be long for Recess to catch up and probably overtake uh, CSS Lint. Uh, Closure Style Sheets is the Google version of CSS Linting um, and also not. So then we need tools to minimize, concatenate, uh, and overall you know, productionify our code. Uh, so Uglify. JS is one of them. Uh, it's a Node.js based compiler. It does both JavaScript and CSS. Uh, Closure compiler is Google's version um, that is very good. Uh, Uglify JS generally wins on all speed benchmarks for uh, concatenating and minifying. Um, Closure barely beats it on actual size of code. Um, of course, you know, your mileage may vary based on your coding style. Uh, these are generally uh, benchmarked against you know large projects like jQuery um, and other you know common um, large projects. Uh, Octoping is a program that allows you to automatically convert your PNGs to be the optimum for the web. 
Uh, so instead of using you know 24-bit mask, you'll use 8-bit mask, uh, which means that you're less likely for it to break in IE6. Uh, and you can have this happening automatically for you. Um, you don't, you know, you the designer, whoever can upload whatever they want, um, and this will fix it for them automatically. Uh, JPEG Tran is a similar one for JPEGs. Uh, Pingquant is another program. Uh, all these, you know, test out, figure out which one works best for you. Uh, Trimage, um, which I'm probably mispronouncing, uh, tries to do it for all images and all types of images. Uh, Image Optimum is the same one, uh, or same thing, trying to do it for multiple types of images rather than, you know, one specific image type. Uh, same thing with ImageMint. Uh, Scour for SVG is a SVG version of this um, that will, you know, you can do an SVG in something like Inkscape or in uh, Adobe Illustrator, and this will strip out all the comments. This will, you know, minimize, you know, minimize the, the SVG so that you only have to be uploading the file exactly how big you need it to be. Uh, HTML compressor will do the same thing for your HTML. It'll eliminate the white space in your HTML so that your HTML is actually smaller. Uh, enhanced CSS is a really interesting idea. Uh, it allows you to automatically base64 encode any image that you mention in your CSS. So now you don't need to be making a request to get the you know, image. It's already there inside of your CSS. Uh, you know, this won't work for all browsers, but depending on what browsers you support, you know, this might be fine. Uh, you know, Sprite, uh, who here uses Sprites? All right, uh, so a decent overview. So Sprites allow you to, you know, have a whole bunch of images in one image and you just specify where in the image you want it to show. So, you know, you want it to show, uh, you know, 20 pixels down and nine pixels over. Um, and that will, you know, be that where that image starts. Um, we can automate the construction of our sprites. Uh, there's a tool so like Glue that will actually automate, you know, and look at your CSS, look at all the images, and compile that into a form that, you know, has your sprites built for you so that you don't have to bother building it. Uh, sprites are really useful for, you know, reducing the number of HTTP requests we need to make uh, to a server. Uh, sprite Factory, it's another one uh, that's really useful for this. Uh, I think both of these are Ruby-based uh, projects. Uh, Confess.js is a really interesting project uh, for building the app cache manifest. Uh, so if you are dealing with a mobile page, uh, you know you want to be able to basically tell the browser like exactly what it needs to request and exactly you know when things are to expire. Uh, app cache manifests are very useful for this, uh, confess.js will automate this process for you so that you don't have to manually build a manifest file for your site. Uh, Inner uh, is a uh, project uh, that will allow you to automatically bring in all the CSS that you reference and all the JavaScript that you reference uh, so that your HTML page becomes one page um, and the only external requests being made for images. Um, so, you know, really cool idea to just overall reduce the number of HTTP requests. Um, so if your bottleneck, you know, in speeding up your site is too many of them, this will allow you to make it go much faster. Uh, Yeoman is another interesting project uh, that uh, it just got announced at uh, Google I.O. Um, for an opinionated workflow. Um, it's not open yet, um, but it combines a lot of the tools mentioned so that there's one workflow that everyone can just use and um, you know try to be a standard workflow for front-end developers. Uh, Paul Irish is leading this charge along with a few others at Google. Um, so some things to think about you know as you're taking these ideas going forward. Um, first, uh, what tests should be run and when? Um, you know how often do you want your unit tests run? Are there certain, you know, depending on how long they take, are there certain tests you only want to run certain times? Um, you want to not stand in the way of your, you know, being able to write code. If your tests take 10 minutes to run, um, they shouldn't be blocking you from, you know, writing more code. Um, so think about this. Um, think about who and how should people be notified of changes. 
you know, who should be getting emails when things are being built? Um, should they be getting emails? Should you be you know, broadcasting this in your IRC channel? Um, should you be, you know, having a dashboard that anyone can look at and see when was the last time uh, each project was built? Um, so think about it, and this will be very much based on how your team works and how your team communicates. Uh, and, you know, how fast can you fail? Um, so we want to fail fast because the faster we fail, the quicker we can succeed. Um, so, you know, just how can we make things ourselves work faster? Um, two books that I would recommend thinking or reading if you want to just read more about how, you know, our human, how the mind works and how we can, you know, improve ourselves, our thinking. Uh, thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which I mentioned in the beginning, is great. Um, it just looks at, you know, the fast think process versus the slow, slow think process um, and the differences. And uh, The Mind of the Market, um, which looks at this on a broader scale um, and is the intersection of economics and psychology. Um, both really great books if you really are interested in the topic um, of how the mind works in order to make ourselves work faster. Uh, so I'd like to encourage you to follow me on Twitter. Um, I tweet nonsense and good stuff occasionally as well. Uh, so are there any questions? Uh, so that is uh, jorb.in slash wcboss2012. Uh, sure, so I can give you uh, three examples that I've used uh, in production. Uh, the first one is for running our JavaScript unit tests. Um, you know, it allows us to have them run on the server so that we don't all have to have, you know, manually run our unit tests. Um, we can run them on commit and, you know, fail build instead of, uh, you know, handling them individually. Um, another example of how we've used uh, PhantomJS, uh, or I, I've used PhantomJS, um, is for uh, building individual infographics um, and rendering them out as PNGs for email. Um, you know, really just, you know, much better than asking a designer to create 20,000 infographics. Um, you know, it allows it in that we can include it in email that way easier as well. Um, and then uh, third one is to check sites for uh, certain code configuration. So, you know, give a um, whole bunch of uh, a list of URLs and find out uh, which version of jQuery are they running um, or, you know, which version are they running jQuery, are they running Google tools um, and not be trying to, uh, you know, parse but actually, like parse HTML, but actually firing up a DOM and asking the DOM what version is Any other questions? All right, so I know I covered a lot of stuff, so I would definitely encourage you to check out these slides, check out the projects that seemed interesting to you and that you think would inspire you to work faster. Um, because the faster the work we work, the faster we fail, and thus the faster that we achieve success. Thank you.